Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining Dr. Michael Seaman and I. I'm Roger Davison. I'm a personal growth consultant, which means I help people just think differently so they can change their behavior and get different results. I work as a consultant primarily in the heating and air conditioning and plumbing industries, but I've worked in many different industries over the 16 years that I've done this. Um, basically, I, I help facilitate building your business by through better relationships with each other internally. Um, I view the sales process as relational. Uh, so, so building better relationships for your clients is going to help you grow your business. But really what, what I do is I grow, help you grow your business by growing your people and building high performing teams that work together to, together in unity of purpose. Dr. Michael Siemens with us. Michael, introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do. I'm Dr. Dr. Michael Siemens, and I've and been working in the behavioral sciences field for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I facilitate health and growth in different systems, whether it's with couples, families, businesses. I've done this work for over 35 years and, under, and really understand how to foster better relationships growing organizations to maximize their effect effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And the, thank you for that. Thank you very much. And we've been doing, we do, we do this lab every Sunday night at 8 PM. Our focus for the last three or four weeks has been on uh, uh, pathogens in the company culture. Um, and a lot of times we'll see things like blaming, uh, excuse making, you know, that's blaming sarcasm, but there's a lot of things that manifest themselves in the company culture. That's a function of something deeper. And what Michael has taught us and brought sort of to the front of our, our thinking process is the, the, the thinking about fairness and how people base their relationships and base what they do in their lives at work and at home on what's fair and what's not fair. And Michael's taught us to think about that as a, to think about that, to think differently about that and to think about giving freely and receiving freely versus making decisions based on fairness. Now I read an article today, Michael, about uh, something that the gentleman called law of law of reciprocity. And I, I know you know what that is, but uh, it, the, the whole article was about, hey, people really are dysfunctional in how they do things. So use their dysfunctionality to manipulate them to do something else. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, no, that, you know, that's that's just another form of manipulation. <laughs> that's right. I mean, so I think I think that when you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, that's, <laughs> and so that sounds to me like that's what you read today. Yeah. And I, I would say to you that the fulcrum, the, the measure of a healthy relationship or an unhealthy relationship is in how people receive. Is 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 not how they receive or is? It's, it's in how a person receives. Yes. If a person receives freely, open heartedly mm -hmm. and responsibly, then that sets the stage for a healthy relationship. If a person receives based on what they think is fair, mm -hmm. even if the giver is giving freely, mm -hmm. but they receive based on what they think is fair, then that starts them down the road of an unhealthy relationship. So the fulcrum or the, the very measure that the one component that I believe is the differential between whether something is healthy or unhealthy is how a person gives and how a person receives. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's let's back up because I think something I got an echo here. Hang on just a second. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my speakers here because I got a bad echo. Well, it went away. Okay. All right. So you say it's important to receive freely. Yeah, that's that's a hard thing to do, Michael. You know the why do you think it's so hard to do, Roger? I think it's hard to do because I think about fairness. Fairness is so close to all of us. We just operate with it auto, almost automatically. I, I like to say to people, if you have a belly button, you're operating based on fairness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so and I've had to make a conscious effort through the years uh, to learn how to receive freely. And it's been a growth process for me personally, but I was first exposed to this probably in the late nineties when I read a book, how to be an assertive Christian uh, by Dr. Hauk. And Dr. Hauk talks about giving and receiving freely. And I began to understand, Hey, a lot of my issues are, I don't, you know, I don't, somebody will give me something and then I'll feel obligated to give them something back. And I had to step. And sometimes I wouldn't receive something because I didn't want to be feel obligated. And it isn't about them. It's about me. And um, so, so when you say it's all about how we receive stuff, I would agree with that 100% because, because somebody can give you something and they choose to do that. Why do I have to choose to allow that to manipulate me? I don't have to choose to allow that to manipulate me. I can just say thank you and receive that freely without any obligation to reciprocate because I didn't ask for the whatever it was they gave me. And, you know, even if you did ask, they still have the choice to say yes or no in giving that thing to you. Well, I don't. Well, there we go. That's a, that's another uh, rabbit hole we could go down because a lot of people don't understand that one. Right. In fact, people will do this. They will avoid situations to keep other people from even asking them something so they don't have to tell them no. That's how profound this is. People will stay out of social situations because they don't want to be asked to do something because then they're going to have to say no and they're going to feel guilty for saying no. Right. But that's all about them. It, 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 every, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Now, let me ask you another question. I, I know we're on a business show, but this relates to business and we'll get to it in a minute. But uh, some people, so one of the things that I've noticed about others is, OK, it's, it's the word no is a difficult thing for a lot of people to say it. And when they have a difficult time saying it, a lot of times they also have a difficult time hearing it. That's right. And it's uh, we've talked about boundaries, but I want to give you an example about and how I had to learn how to do this. And it helped me in my relationships with my family. But um, this was many years ago and I'm talking to my, my mother calls me and it's about 630 in the morning, maybe 645. And I had just dropped my daughter off at school and it was raining on a Monday. And uh I answered the phone and here's what it sounded like. Uh, Roger, where are you? Just that little twinge of, you know, manipulation. I'm poor victim me. Just nothing. She said, and I said, I said, I just slept Margaret Ann out of school. What's up? Oh, nothing. <laughs> and I, I said, OK. She said, well, what are you doing in about 30 minutes? And I said, and I stopped the game. And I said, I said, is there something you need to ask me? And then she got angry and said, ah, oh, nobody takes care of me. And I said, what? I just got up. What's up? What do you, what, what do you, need? well, I'm up here and it's raining and I can't get out of the house. Da, 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 da. And nobody died. And I'm like, what do you need to ask? And she finally said, well, can you go to the store and get my medicine for me this morning? And I thought and I stepped back and I said, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. But here's here's the question. Why could she not just ask me that in a respectful, direct, upfront manner? I think I know the answer. Tell us, you're the expert. You know, I think a lot of times to the extent that people have a hard time asking for what they want. They also have a hard time, an equally hard time of hearing no as an answer. That's right. Because it's going to represent disappointment. It's going to represent hurt. It's mm -hmm. going to represent sadness. You know, it, it really represents, it could represent, you know what? If you tell me no, you must not love me. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but mm -hmm. we associate all kinds of things with hearing no as an answer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that, that aren't true. Right. Now, now, and say I grew up in a in a household where you didn't say no. I didn't I didn't understand as a kid that I could say no. That was taken from me as a child because if I said no to a father figure, my father, I'd get the crap beat out of me. 
and I can remember it rings in my ear. Don't you say no to me. Well, I think it was important for me to learn that I had the right to say no, even to my father. But yet I also had to learn that I would suffer the consequences of saying no or yes. And that, but that's different. That's different. You know, when you can, when you can step back and say, you may say no to not going to school today, but here's going to be the consequences if you don't go. Right. See, that's a healthier kid right. because when I got into sales uh, and owned a business, I needed to be able to tell people no. I needed yeah. to be able to tell employees no. I needed to be able to tell lots of people no. And my life was a mess in business because I didn't understand no. And, and could you hear no as an answer, Roger? No, I couldn't. I couldn't say it and I couldn't hear it. So, so tell me, how did you get out of that cycle of always saying yes? And then how, how'd you get out of that? Uh, sat in your office a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but when I started practicing, here's where I started practicing. I, telemarketers would call me. And, you know, this was back in the 90s when I was growing, growing through this. And I would just, I would answer the phone politely, respectfully, hello, and listen. Okay. And when they finished, I would say, no, thank you. And they would ignore me and do whatever it is they're trained to do. And then I would listen respectfully and say, no, thank you. Right. And then they would, they would do it many times. And I would say, no, thank you, Michael, a lot of times until they would hang up. They would hang up on me. And I think what happened is they would never hear a respectful no from anybody. And they didn't know what to do with it. Right. And they, not, and they didn't respect no either. But that's, that's a different different subject, but, uh, but, but the, the, but the no is so important to be able to say it and to be able to hear it. It is important. You know, we have to, let's get back to a, a little bit to obligation. And so I think, I think that the idea of feeling guilty, if you tell somebody no mm -hmm. is associated with obligation. So mm -hmm. we say yes, but then we get, well, sometimes we get angry because we've, we've overcommitted ourselves. And what will happen is a lot of times is that people will blame other people for even asking them. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't have asked me because they know I can't tell them no. Well, that person doesn't have that voice like you're talking about and the ability to say no as an answer mm -hmm. because they feel so obligated or stuck or trapped in keeping the connection between them and the person who's asking, mm -hmm. keeping it together. Mm -hmm. And that's really, we call that codependence. We call that just dependence itself. And so it's about being able to stand in your own right and trust that you're going to be okay when you say yes or when you say no. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's one of the keys to being able to receive freely is mm -hmm. you're being able to say, you know what? Yes or no, that works for me. That doesn't work for me. And, you know, some people are very good at that. Some people are not very good, good at that at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we talk about when you get, get, get hired, that employer freely gives you the job. That's right. The free gift that comes with payments. That's right. They pay you for your time, but it, but they chose freely to give you that job. You didn't That's take right. the job. You didn't earn the job. They, they gave it to you freely. That's right. You didn't even get the job. They gave it to you. They gave it to you. It's their job to give and they gave. And it's okay. your, your, and your responsibility, a healthier mindset is, okay, I'm going to receive this job freely. That's right. So, so how much do I owe that employer the first day I go to work? I would say you don't owe that employer one thing. Now you have a great responsibility to that employer mm -hmm. and it's about fulfilling the weight, the full weight of their responsibility with that employer and embracing that and choosing to do the very best job you can do and thinking imaginatively about how can you add value to that, uh, in, in that, uh, that position or that business or that company. And a lot of times employers or bosses really sh shrink back from this idea that they don't want their, they want their employees to feel obligated. Mm -hmm. And that's a very short term, short sighted approach because they're thinking, I want to get as much out of you as I can get. And the issue is that they're not even accessing the value of that employee 
as a person who can think for himself and be able to offer the company possibilities that, I mean, I think that's the greatest um, deficit in most companies is that they have people who are able to go through the processes and think imaginatively about how to do things differently or better. And because they're so focused on get the task accomplished, they don't access the value. Companies don't access the value of those employees and their ability to see things to be done differently. Mm -hmm. They just want people to be obligated to the task. Okay. So sometimes the the fairness, obligation, resentment cycle starts with the mindset of the leadership. It does, but it, it you know what? Even if you have leaders, and this is kind of a strange thing to say, even if you have leaders who are giving freely and they would want their, their employees to say, you know what? I don't owe you anything, employer. I am here and I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to take this on and really embrace it. Even when you have employers who want their employees to say that and they're giving freely, the employee still has an opportunity to receive it as an obligation. Think of it like parenting. When you parent your children, parents give freely for the most part. We would hope that they do. (laughs) And so, but the, the issue is if you ask a child, what that child owes the parent, nine times out of 10, that child's gonna say, well, my life, everything, look at all they've done for me. And that's not the answer that parents want to, their children to have. Mm-hmm. And yet that's the answer that children have because they feel obligated. It's not because parents necessarily give, wanting that obligation. Parents can give freely, but like I said, the key is the parents can give freely, but the child's still gotta receive freely. Mm-hmm. And this is where it all begins is in, in a person's childhood is to be able to have parents giving freely, children receiving freely. And that translates into how do you give and receive in marriage when you have your own children? And when you get that job, how do you receive when you have that customer? How do you give them the freedom to say yes or no in a relationship? That's a two way relationship. Well, that is Extremely important in sales, in my opinion, is that you have to give your client. I got this second. You have to give. You have to give the client the. Uh, I call it like open an. Oh, if I can open up room or space for them to say no. Yes. It opens up more space for them to say yes. That's right. And I'm okay with them telling me no because they might need to say no. Yes. No might be the best choice for them. Yes. And uh, you'll never hear a sales trainer teach that in any, in most traditional sales. But so I guess, let me back up in the, in the client customer relationship. When you allow them as the client to say no, and in fact, encourage them to say no, if they have to, is that out of, uh, out of giving and receiving freely? Is that an attitude of giving and receiving freely? It is actually. And you know what? It's interesting. It may be that the salesperson needs to hear no as an answer too, not because he, uh, well, let me just say it this way. He, he may need to sit, hear an answer of no in order to make him a better salesperson. Mm-hmm. And so he may not get that sale that time, but again, it's developing the relationship between the customer and the salesperson that's more important than that one momentary sale. That's correct. That's correct. Because, uh, because the, 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 the money, the revenue comes from the relationship through time. Right. And the, that's that salesperson who has many great, many cl- good relationships with many people are going to have more money through time. That's right. You can't chase money. No. And he's going to have more, uh, satisfied clients and customers through time. That's right. Cause of that. You know, Roger, one of the characteristics that I find in people who receive and feel a sense of obligation is they do what they do Mm half-heartedly. Let me give you a great example. Okay. Years ago when my kids were small, my wife would be home and, and and I'd get home and she'd say, boy, those kids need a bath. And I said, oh, man, OK, come on, kids. Let's, I'd drag them upstairs and I'd run the water and just barely drag the rag and I'd get them halfway clean and 
get them out. It was a burden. It was heavy. It was an obligation. And I, I did it half heartedly, half halfway. And then one day I woke up and realized, you know, my kids are not always going to be small. And mm -hmm. so my wife would say, Hey, you know, those kids need a bath. And I say, Hey guys, let's go get a bath. And we ran upstairs and run the water and splash and have a big time. And the difference, everything was exactly the same. Uh -huh. The difference was how I received the task. Mm -hmm. You didn't so, receive it. You did prior. You didn't receive it freely. You know, I received it as an obligation and I did it half heartedly. I did it half wittingly. I just barely did it. And then when I woke up, <laughs> I realized, you know, I have a, a great responsibility here with my children. And mm -hmm. so I get in there and, and it, we made it fun. The kids, mm -hmm. you know, had a, had a great time because I changed my attitude about how I received the task. Mm -hmm. you, changed, you changed your thinking. I did. And that changed everything else. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, another characteristic is people tend to take shortcuts. Mm -hmm. They look for the easy way out. Um, they just they just do things um, half heartedly, and then they they don't really take ownership of the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference in, in my example is I took ownership of it, and I got them clean, and they were fine. And the difference was just in my attitude and the way I was thinking about it. I received the task freely. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yep. I had an experience this week with a client and I want your I want I want you to give me the psychology behind what's going on. Um this particular gentleman was uh upset with me and had been offended by something that I did and I won't go into the details but but basically it was there's there are things that need to be told directly to people and he chooses to go through a third party to tell them. Yeah. triangulation right and uh so he was he and i were disagreeing about that and you know he he, he thinks it's uh okay to do it that way and i'm and i and i, I think differently and uh and so i said and so i said well you know this is this is the proper way to do it and he said well i've done this for a long time this is the way it works and and i said well uh okay i said here's what we need to do next since we have this conflict you and i what you and i need to do is we need to go to your boss with me and me and him and you will work through this together yeah. and then he says oh well whatever he says i'll do that's a that's a great example of avoiding personal responsibility for his own thoughts for his mm -hmm. own ability to be a separate person. Whatever he says, I'll, I'll just do it. Well, that's not, that's not receiving freely in any capacity. What is it? It's avoiding conflict. It's avoiding personal responsibility. It could be all kinds of things, but truly it's a, it could be, uh, you know, not wanting to upset the boss, avoiding, I mean, it could be just all kinds of things, but it's ultimately the bottom line is he's not taking the weight of the responsibility for his own decision making mm -hmm. and being able to say, okay, I'll choose and we'll have a conversation where I'm really part of the dialogue. Right. Yeah. And uh, I've got all these devices going off here. I sometimes have to adjust them. Um, so what, what's the prognosis for a culture like that? What, what's the prognosis? How, how do you how do you change that in the culture? Well, the, the prognosis is not good, but this is what happens: is when a person feels obligated, they receive in a sense of obligation that mm -hmm. results in resentment, and then the, a person works really, really hard to get out of that sense of being stuck and trapped and res, full of resentment, and they work really hard trying to measure up and be good enough, and then. At the end of the day, when they spent years trying to measure for me good enough and they put their life in the boss's hands, if you will, mm -hmm. then what happens is they end up empty inside and they say, see, I can never please him. He would never be pleased. I could never be good enough. And this is what accounts for turnover. A person leaves a company 
because they have a sense that they're empty inside of they're full of resentment. Mm -hmm. So the prognosis is not good. But you know what? It's interesting to me how businesses do not get this. This is a function of the relationship that an employee has with an employer and the relationship of the employer with the employee. And it all starts with what they think is fair. And fairness is nothing more than what you feel like you owe or deserve from another person, mm -hmm. whether that person is a spouse or ch children or an employer. So mm -hmm. the prognosis is not good. What you have to do is you have to teach people how to receive freely. That's, that's the short answer. Mm -hmm. And receiving freely is a difficult thing to do. I, I know I had to learn how to do that. Yes, it is. Um, talk to me about, um, in the context of work, yeah. there are, you know, let's, so, you know, I'm, I, res, I, I, I'm, I have a responsibility to my employer, That's but right. I don't owe him anything other than just, a, but I have a responsibility to own the role in the business and get the, get the job done and be creative and, and grow the business. But yet there are processes, procedures, sequences of events that, that are expected because there are processes and, and companies that need to be followed. How it, explain to me how I'm not obligated to do those things. It's not obligation. What is it? It's responsibility. What, what happens, Roger, is that you want to know the full extent of the, the scope of your work, of what's required of you, what, what you embrace. Uh -huh. And again, the issue is this. I just said it what's required of you, a person can escape into what's required of them mm -hmm. or a person can embrace what the employer requires mm -hmm. and then they require more of themselves mm -hmm. than the employer requires of them. Let me give you a great example that happened today to me. Mm -hmm. I own the building that my office is in and today I needed, I was the maintenance man. Mm -hmm. And so I went out and I had to cut bushes back from around the perimeter of the house. And I did that this afternoon. I got all that done. There's nobody telling me I need to get it done. I mm -hmm. just know I got to get it done. Mm -hmm. And so there I have, I have folks who rent space in the building and it's my personal responsibility to make sure that the building is clean. It's presentable. It's, it's there. So although I'm the owner of the building, I'm also the maintenance man and the janitor <laughs> and, and I'm embracing those tasks mm -hmm. because they're mine to do. Okay. So you can either escape into what's required. Yes. And that means you just do what you're obligated to do and no more. That's right. Half-heartedly. Half-heartedly. Or you can, receive the receive the job freely yes be responsible think for yourself and add value to what you're bringing and yes. that's giving freely and you know yeah. what that helps you keep the job it does because when you're thinking imaginatively about how to do that work better mm -hmm. then employers really appreciate that and if i'm on the phone with my employer 24 7 what do i do here what do i do there that gets boring. That gets tiring for the employer. They want you to think your own thoughts, have enough authority, personal authority to step into the task and accomplish it. I disagree with you a little bit because I, I, I agree with the theory, but when you say they want you to do stuff, I've seen places where it's just, you know, everybody's just, it's awful. It's just goes here, here, here. And right. everybody's, you know, hand in the, you know, everybody's just doing what's required of them. Well, see, I guess what I'm thinking is if the employer is giving freely and the employees are receiving freely, then that's a whole different dynamic. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. yeah it is. Um, so fairness leads to obligation. Which leads to resentment. What? Okay. What comes? Does anger come before resentment? Usually the anger is a function of the, it's, it's kind of, we talk about resentment 
But anger is a moment in time, and resentment builds is a case that you build over time. Okay. Can you become resentment without feeling anger in moments in time? You know, you, you might not identify it as anger, but it's really anger. It's it's feeling stuck, feeling trapped, feeling like you have fewer choices rather than more choices. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, it's funny how we might, might use different language for the same phenomena. It, it's resentment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and reason fairness is a terrible uh, foundation for relationships is because both people are going to feel different about what's fair. That's right. And, and they're always going to be different. And that sets the stage for what we call will conflict. Mm -hmm. Will conflict is the cancer that eats relationships alive from inside out. Mm -hmm. Where a person says, I did this. And another person says, well, I did that. And they're always building a case against each other. I have an, I have an example. Since you, you just opened up a file. I had a conversation this week with a family member. And this family member is not happy with me. And the reason this family member is not happy with me is because I've said no to this family member twice on two different subjects. And we had a conversation two days ago and it was, do you remember when I did X, Y, and Z for you? And I said, yes. Did you give that freely? And this person in the family said, yes, I did. And I said, well, good, because I received it freely. Yeah. So right there, that stopped the will conflict because it wasn't, I did this for you. And then I said, I, yeah, but I did this for you. I didn't do anything for this person. This right. person, this person did for me and I received it freely and I'm done. Did they let it go or are they still holding on to it? No, they, they said they did, but they're, they're resentful, angry. So, so, they're uh, still, so they're still holding on to what they did for you, which really is not for you. Mm -hmm as much as it's for them. Okay. They built a case against you uh -huh. and they're holding on to that rope and expecting you to fulfill that obligation that you have to them. But I don't have an obligation to them because I received it freely. And that person's mine. <laughs> but yeah. listen, here's the important point that I want people to understand from, from my perspective. That thinking process for me has made me a free person. Absolutely. I have got so much freedom. I'm yeah. not stuck. I don't, you know, you mentioned stuck and what were the other trapped? trapped. I yeah. used to feel that way. Yeah. But now I don't. And, you know, I had to step back from the emotion of the moment and, 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 but, but understanding the not thinking pathological allowed me to get through that. And, and and remain free, mo remain free, a free person. I'm not I'm not stuck or trapped. Roger, as we close this down tonight, let me give you just a model real quick. When a person is free and feels obligated, they end up resenting it. They work really hard to try to measure it and be good enough. Mm -hmm. They feel empty inside and they end the relationship. When you receive freely, you have a responsibility and in gratitude, you fulfill that responsibility and in humility, you come back and spend time fulfilling that responsibility, thinking, how can I do this better? Mm -hmm. And that leads to contentment, mm -hmm. which is, this, I call this living either below the line or above the line. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is help companies, help individuals, help departments live above the line. Mm -hmm. Michael, I have, a, I have an, an idea right here. Oh, give your website. Yeah. I want everybody to go to your website and listen to the banker. The website is relationshipsincorporated.com. And when you go there, you'll see the homepage. Go over to the blog. And the blog has several different 
uh, entries. And one is how not to have a relationship. And another entry is how to have a relationship. And this illustrates uh, in video format, the living below the line and living above the line. Mm -hmm. And what's the website again? Relationships Incorporated dot com. It's all spelled out one word. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for joining tonight. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, Michael is in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm broadcasting from uh, 26 miles north of Central Park in the Hudson Valley. Um, please go to my website. It's rogerdavidson.com and sign up for the premium content. All you got to do is give your email address and there's lots of content you can watch similar to this, past blabs that we've done. Uh, if you're watching us tonight on YouTube and you enjoyed the show, share it with every, somebody, share it with others and give us a thumbs up. Michael, I've, been, I've enjoyed the show tonight. Uh, thank you very much. I have to. Thank you, Roger.